Mahayana, Sanskrit for great vehicle, is one of two main existing branches of Buddhism, the other being Theravada and a term for classification of Buddhist philosophies and practice. This movement added a further set of discourses, and although it was initially small in India, it had long-term historical significance. The Buddhist tradition of Vajrayana is sometimes classified as a part of Mahayana Buddhism, but some scholars consider it to be a different branch altogether. According to the teachings of Mahayana traditions, Mahayana also refers to the path of the Bodhisattva seeking complete enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, also called Bodhisattvayana or the Bodhisattva vehicle. A Bodhisattva who has accomplished this goal is called a Samyaksambuddha, or fully enlightened Buddha. A Samyaksambuddha can establish the Dharma and lead disciples to enlightenment. Mahayana Buddhists teach that enlightenment can be attained in a single lifetime, and this can be accomplished even by a layperson. The Mahayana tradition is the largest major tradition of Buddhism existing today, with 53% of practitioners, compared to 36% for Theravada and 6% for Vajrayana in 2010. In the course of its history, Mahayana Buddhism spread from India to various other South, East, and Southeast Asian countries such as Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, China, Taiwan. Taiwan, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore. Mahayana Buddhism also spread to other South and Southeast Asian countries, such as Afghanistan, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, the Maldives, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Burma, Iran and other Central Asian countries before being replaced by Theravada Buddhism or other religions. Large Mahayana scholastic centers such as Nalanda thrived during the latter period of Buddhism in India, between the 7th and 12th centuries. Major traditions of Mahayana Buddhism today include Chan Buddhism, Korean Seon, Japanese Zen, Pure Land Buddhism, Nichiren Buddhism and Vietnamese Buddhism. It may also include the Vajrayana traditions of Tiantai, Tendai, Shingon Buddhism, and Tibetan Buddhism, which add esoteric teachings to the Mahayana tradition. Etymology <inaudible> 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 According to Jan Natier, the term Mahayana, great vehicle, was originally an honorary synonym for Bodhisattvayana, Bodhisattva vehicle, the vehicle of a Bodhisattva seeking Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. The term Mahayana, which had earlier been used simply as an epithet for Buddhism itself, was therefore adopted at an early date as a synonym for the path and the teachings of the Bodhisattvas. Since it was simply an honorary term for Bodhisattvayana, the adoption of the term Mahayana and its application to Bodhisattvayana did not represent a significant turning point in the development of a Mahayana tradition. The earliest Mahayana texts often use the term Mahayana as a synonym for Bodhisattvayana, but the term Hinayana is comparatively rare in the earliest sources. The presumed dichotomy between Mahayana and Hinayana can be deceptive, as the two terms were not actually formed in relation to one another in the same era. Among the earliest and most important references to Mahayana are those that occur in the Lotus Sutra (SKT), Sadharma Pundarika Sutra, dating between the first century BCE and the first century CE. Saishi Karashima has suggested that the term first used in an earlier Gandhari Prakrit version of the Lotus Sutra was not the term Mahayana but the Prakrit word Mahajana in the sense of Mahajnana great knowing. At a later stage when the early Prakrit word was converted into Sanskrit, this Mahajana, being phonetically ambivalent, was mistakenly converted into Mahayana, possibly because of what may have been a double meaning in the famous parable of the burning house, which talks of three vehicles or carts SKT, yana. History Topic. Origin theories The origins of Mahayana are still not completely understood and there are numerous competing theories. The earliest Western views of Mahayana assumed that it existed as a separate school in competition with the so-called Hinayana schools. 
According to David Drews, for most of the 20th century, the leading theories about the origins of Mahayana were that it was either a lay movement first argued by Jean Perzaluski and supported by Etienne Lamotte and Akira Hirakawa or that it developed among the Mahasamgika Nikaya. These theories have recently been mostly overturned or shown to be problematic. The earliest textual evidence of Mahayana comes from sutras originating around the beginning of the Common Era. Jan Natier has noted that some of the earliest Mahayana texts, such as the Ugrapriprasha Sutra use the term Mahayana, yet there is no doctrinal difference between Mahayana in this context and the early schools, and that Mahayana referred rather to the rigorous emulation of Gautama Buddha in the path of a bodhisattva seeking to become a fully enlightened Buddha. Natier writes that in the UGRA, Mahayana is not a school, but a rigorous and demanding spiritual vocation, to be pursued within the existing Buddhist community. Several scholars such as Hendrik Kern and A.K. Warder suggested that Mahayana and its sutras such as the very first versions of the Prajnaparamita genre developed among the Mahasamgika Nikaya from the 1st century BCE onwards, some pointing to the area along the Kursna River in the Andhra region of southern India as a geographical origin. Paul Williams thinks that there can be no doubt that at least some early Mahayana sutras originated in Mahasamgika circles. Pointing to the Mahasamgika doctrine of the supramundane Lokutra nature of the Buddha, which is very close to the Mahayana view of the Buddha, Anthony Barber and Sri Padma note that historians of Buddhist thought have been aware for quite some time that such pivotally important Mahayana Buddhist thinkers as Nagarjuna, Dignaga, Kandrakirti, Aryadeva, and Bhavavivaka, among many others, formulated their theories while living in Buddhist communities in Andhra. However, more recently Saishi Karashima has argued for their origin in the Gandhara region. Some scholars such as Warder think that after a period of composition in the south, later the activity of writing additional scriptures moved to the north. Joseph Walzer also notes that certain other sutras betray a northwestern origin and mention products of trade with China or obtained outside of India, such as silk or coral. Important pieces of evidence for the early Mahayana include the texts translated by the monk Lokaksima in the 2nd century CE, who came to China from the kingdom of Gandhara. These are some of the earliest known Mahayana texts. Study of these texts by Paul Harrison and others show that they strongly promote monasticism, contra the lay origin theory, acknowledge the legitimacy of arhatship, do not recommend devotion towards celestial bodhisattvas and do not show any attempt to establish a new sect or order. Some of these texts often emphasize ascetic practices, forest dwelling, and deep states of meditative concentration, samadhi. Some scholars further speculate that the Prajnaparamita sutras were written in response to certain theories of the Abhidharma schools. Evidence from sutras which depict a close connection of Mahayana with monasticism eventually revealed the problems with the lay origins theory. The Mahasamgika origins theory has also slowly been shown to be problematic by scholarship that revealed how certain Mahayana sutras show traces of having developed among other Nikayas or monastic orders, such as the Dharmaguptaka. Because of such evidence, scholars like Paul Harrison and Paul Williams argue that the movement was not sectarian and possibly pan-Buddhist. There is no evidence that Mahayana ever referred to a separate formal school or sect of Buddhism, but rather that it existed as a certain set of ideals, and later doctrines, for aspiring bodhisattvas. Paul Williams has also noted that Mahayana never had nor ever attempted to have a separate Vinaya or ordination lineage from the early schools of Buddhism, and therefore each bhiksu or bisuni adhering to the Mahayana formally belonged to an early school. Membership in these Nikayas, or monastic sects, continues today with the Dharmaguptaka Nikaya in East Asia, and the Mulasarvastavada Nikaya in Tibetan Buddhism. Therefore, Mahayana was never a separate rival sect of the early schools. Paul Harrison clarifies that while monastic Mahayanists belonged to a Nikaya, not all members of a Nikaya were Mahayanists. From Chinese monks visiting India, we now know that both Mahayana and non-Mahayana monks in India often lived in the same monasteries side by side. It is also possible that, formally, Mahayana would have been understood as a group of monks or nuns within a larger monastery taking a vow together, known as a Kriyakarma, 
To memorize and study a Mahayana text or texts, Gregory Chopin meanwhile has argued that a series of loosely connected movements developed during the second century around cult shrines where Mahayana sutras were kept, and the cult of the book. Theory is also popular among other current scholars. After examining the epigraphic evidence, Chopin also argues that Mahayana remained an extremely limited minority movement, if it remained at all, that attracted absolutely no documented public or popular support for at least two more centuries. Chopin also sees this movement as being in tension with other Buddhists, struggling for recognition and acceptance. Their embattled mentality may have led to certain elements found in Mahayana texts such as the Lotus Sutra. Likewise, Joseph Walzer speaks of Mahayana's virtual invisibility in the archaeological record until the 5th century. Chopin, Harrison and Natier also argue that these communities were probably not a single unified movement, but scattered groups based on different practices and sutras. One reason for this view is that Mahayana sources are extremely diverse, advocating many different, often conflicting doctrines and positions, as Jan Natier writes. Thus we find one scripture, the Aksobhyavyuha, that advocates both sravaka and bodhisattva practices, propounds the possibility of rebirth in a pure land, and enthusiastically recommends the cult of the book, yet seems to know nothing of emptiness theory, the ten bhumis, or the trikaya, while another, the pu sa pen ye ching, propounds the ten bhumis and focuses exclusively on the path of the bodhisattva, but never discusses the paramitas. A Madhyamika treatise may enthusiastically deploy the rhetoric of emptiness without ever mentioning the bodhisattva path, while a Yogacara treatise may delve into the particulars of the Trikaya doctrine while eschewing the doctrine of Ekayana. We must be prepared, in other words, to encounter a multiplicity of Mahayanas flourishing even in India, not to mention those that developed in East Asia and Tibet. One of the current leading theories is what Paul Harrison calls the forest hypothesis, and defines as the Mahayana was the work of hardcore ascetics, members of the forest dwelling Aranyavasan wing of the Buddhist order. Some scholars point to how some of the earliest Mahayana texts often depict strict adherence to the path of a bodhisattva, an engagement in the ascetic ideal of a monastic life in the wilderness, akin to the ideas expressed in the Rhinoceros Sutra. Reginald Ray has also defended this view in his Buddhist Saints in India 1994. Likewise, Jan Natier's study of the Ugrapriprasha Sutra, A Few Good Men 2003, argues that this sutra represents the earliest form of Mahayana, which presents the Bodhisattva path as a supremely DIF cult enterprise of elite monastic forest asceticism. Boucher's study on the Rastrapalapariprasha Sutra 2008, is another recent work on this subject. David Drews argues against both the book cult hypothesis and the forest hypothesis. He points out that there is no actual evidence for existence of book shrines, that the practice of sutra veneration was pan-Buddhist and not distinctly Mahayana, and that Mahayana sutras advocate nemic, oral, oral practices more frequently than they do written ones. Regarding the forest hypothesis, he points out that only two of the twelve or so texts of the Lokaksima corpus directly advocate forest dwelling, while the others either do not mention it or see it as unhelpful, promoting easier practices such as merely listening to the sutra, or thinking of particular Buddhas, that they claim can enable one to be reborn in special, luxurious pure lands where one will be able to make easy and rapid progress on the bodhisattva path and attain Buddhahood after as little as one lifetime. Drews states that the evidence merely shows that Mahayana was primarily a textual movement, focused on the revelation, preaching, and dissemination of Mahayana sutras, that developed within, and never really departed from, traditional Buddhist social and institutional structures. Drews points out the importance of Dharmabhanakas, preachers, reciters of these sutras in the early Mahayana sutras. This figure is widely praised as someone who should be respected, obeyed, as a slave serves his lord, and donated to, and it is thus possible these people were the primary agents of the Mahayana movement. Topic. Earliest inscriptions 
The earliest stone inscription containing a recognizably Mahayana formulation and a mention of the Buddha Amitabha was found in the Indian subcontinent in Mathura, and dated to around 180 CE. Remains of a statue of a Buddha bear the Brahmi inscription, made in the year 28 of the reign of King Huviska. For the Blessed One, the Buddha Amitabha. There is also some evidence that Emperor Huviska himself was a follower of Mahayana Buddhism, and a Sanskrit manuscript fragment in the Shoyan collection describes Huviska as having set forth in the Mahayana. Evidence of the name Mahayana in Indian inscriptions in the period before the 5th century is very limited in comparison to the multiplicity of Mahayana writings transmitted from Central Asia to China at that time. Topic. Growth The Mahayana movement or movements remained quite small until it became established in the 5th century, with very few manuscripts have been found before then the exceptions are from Bamiyan. According to Walzer, the 5th and 6th centuries appear to have been a watershed for the production of Mahayana manuscripts. Likewise it is only in the 4th and 5th centuries CE that epigraphic evidence shows some kind of popular support for Mahayana, including some possible royal support at the Kingdom of Shan Shan as well as in Bamiyan and Mathura. Still, even after the 5th century, the epigraphic evidence which use the term Mahayana is still quite small and is notably mainly monastic, not lay. By this time, Chinese pilgrims, such as Faxian, Yijing, and Xuanzang were traveling to India, and their writings do describe monasteries which they label Mahayana as well as monasteries where both Mahayana monks and non-Mahayana monks lived together. After the 5th century, Mahayana Buddhism and its institutions slowly grew in influence. Some of the most influential institutions became massive monastic university complexes such as Nalanda established by the 5th century CE Gupta Emperor, Kumaragupta I and Vikramashila established under Dharma policy. 783 to 820 which were centers of various branches of scholarship, including Mahayana philosophy. The Nalanda complex eventually became the largest and most influential Buddhist center in India for centuries. Even so, as noted by Paul Williams, it seems that fewer than 50% of the monks encountered by Xuanzang Suan Sang, c. 600-664 on his visit to India actually were Mahayanists. Indian Mahayana developed various schools of thought. Some groupings include Madhyamaka, Yogacara, Buddha Nature, Tathagatagarbha, and Buddhist logic as the last and most recent. Over time Indian Mahayana texts and philosophy reached Central Asia and China through trade routes, afterwards spreading throughout East Asia. In some cases Indian philosophical traditions were directly transplanted, as with the case of the East Asian Madhyamaka and East Asian Yogacara schools. Later, new developments in Chinese Mahayana led to new Chinese schools like Tiantai, Huayan and Chan Buddhism Zen. Forms of Mahayana based on the doctrines of the Prajnaparamita Sutras, Buddha Nature Sutras, Lotus Sutra and the Pure Land teachings are still popular in East Asian Buddhism, which is completely dominated by branches of Mahayana. Paul Williams has noted that in this tradition in the Far East, primacy has always been given to study of the Mahayana Sutras. Topic. Later developments. Under the Gupta and Pala empires, a new movement began to develop which drew on previous Mahayana doctrine as well as new ideas and which came to be known by various names such as Vajrayana, Mantrayana, and Tantric Buddhism. Possibly led by groups of wandering Tantric yogis named Mahasiddhas, this movement developed new Tantric spiritual practices and also promoted new texts called the Buddhist Tantras. This new form of Buddhism eventually also spread north to Tibet and east to China. Various classes of Vajrayana literature developed as a result of royal courts sponsoring both Buddhism and Savism. The Manjusramalakalpa, which later came to classified under Kriyatantra, states that mantras taught in the Shaiva, Garuda and Vaishnava tantras will be effective if applied by Buddhists since they were all taught originally by Manjushri. 
The Guyasiddhi of Padmavajra, a work associated with the Guyasamaja tradition, prescribes acting as a Shaiva guru and initiating members into Saiva Siddhanta scriptures and mandalas. The Samvara Tantra texts adopted the Pitha list from the Shaiva text Tantrasadbhava, introducing a copying error where a deity was mistaken for a place. Topic. Doctrine Few things can be said with certainty about Mahayana Buddhism, especially its early Indian form, other than that the Buddhism practiced in China, Indonesia, Vietnam, Korea, Tibet, and Japan is Mahayana Buddhism. Mahayana can be described as a loosely bound collection of many teachings with large and expansive doctrines that are able to exist simultaneously. Mahayana constitutes an inclusive set of traditions characterized by plurality and the adoption of new Mahayana sutras in addition to the earlier agamas. Mahayana sees itself as penetrating further and more profoundly into the Buddha's Dharma. An Indian commentary on the Mahayana Samgraha, entitled Vivartagyahyarthapandavyaya, gives a classification of teachings according to the capabilities of the audience. A see according to disciples' grades, the Dharma is classified as inferior and superior. For example, the inferior was taught to the merchants Tripusa and Balaka because they were ordinary men, the middle was taught to the group of five because they were at the stage of saints, the eightfold Prajnaparamitas were taught to Bodhisattvas, and the Prajnaparamitas are superior in eliminating conceptually imagined forms. There is also a tendency in Mahayana sutras to regard adherence to these sutras as generating spiritual benefits greater than those that arise from being a follower of the non-Mahayana approaches to Dharma. Thus the Sramaladevi Simanada Sutra claims that the Buddha said that devotion to Mahayana is inherently superior in its virtues to following the Sravaka or Pratyekabuddha paths. Topic. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are central elements of Mahayana. Mahayana's vastly expanded cosmology, with various Buddhas and Bodhisattvas residing in different worlds and Buddha fields Buddha K, etc. An important feature of Mahayana is the way that it understands the nature of a Buddha, which differs from non-Mahayana understandings. Mahayana texts not only often depict numerous Buddhas besides Sakamuni, but see them as transcendental or supramundane Lokutra beings. According to Paul Williams, for the Mahayana, a Buddha is often seen as a spiritual king, relating to and caring for the world, rather than simply a teacher who after his death has completely gone beyond the world and its cares. Buddha Sakamuni's life and death on earth is then usually understood as a mere appearance. His death is a show, while in actuality he remains out of compassion to help all sentient beings. Dr. Guang Xing describes the Mahayana Buddha as an omnipotent divinity endowed with numerous supernatural attributes and qualities. He is described almost as an omnipotent and almighty godhead. The concept of the three bodies, Trikaya, of the Buddha was developed to make sense of these ideas, with Nirmanakaya Buddhas like Sakamuni being seen as an emanation from the Dharmakaya. Through the use of various practices, a Mahayana devotee can aspire to be reborn in a Buddha's pure land or Buddha field, where they can strive towards Buddhahood in the best possible conditions. Depending on the sect, liberation into a Buddha field can be obtained by faith, meditation, or sometimes even by the repetition of Buddha's name. Faith-based devotional practices focused on rebirth in pure lands are common in East Asian pure land Buddhism. Mahayana generally holds that pursuing only the personal release from suffering i.e. nirvana is a narrow or inferior aspiration, because it lacks the resolve to liberate all other sentient beings from samsara the round of rebirth by becoming a Buddha. One who engages in this path to complete Buddhahood is called a bodhisattva. High-level bodhisattvas are also seen as extremely powerful supramundane beings. Popular bodhisattvas include Avalokiteshvara, Manjushri and Maitreya. Bodhisattvas could reach the personal nirvana of the arhats, but they believe it is more important to remain in samsara and help others. There are two models for this which are seen in the various Mahayana texts. One is the idea that a bodhisattva must postpone their awakening until Buddhahood is attained. 
This could take eons and in the meantime they will be helping countless beings. After reaching Buddhahood, they do pass on to cessation nirvana, just like an arhat. The second model is the idea that there are two kinds of nirvana, the nirvana of an arhat and a superior type of nirvana called a pratisthita non-abiding that allows a Buddha to remain forever engaged in the world. As noted by Paul Williams, the idea of a pratisthita nirvana may have taken some time to develop and is not obvious in some of the early Mahayana literature. Topic. The Bodhisattva Path The Mahayana Bodhisattva Path marga or vehicle yana is seen as being the superior spiritual path by Mahayanists, over and above the paths of those who seek arhatship or solitary Buddhahood for their own sake Sravakayana and Pratyekabuddhayana. According to 8th century Mahayana philosopher Haribhadra, the term Bodhisattva can refer to those who follow any of the three vehicles, since all are working towards bodhi awakening, and hence the technical term for a Mahayana bodhisattva is a Mahasattva great being bodhisattva. According to Paul Williams, a Mahayana bodhisattva is best defined as, that being who has taken the vow to be reborn, no matter how many times this may be necessary, in order to attain the highest possible goal, that of complete and perfect Buddhahood. This is for the benefit of all sentient beings, taking the bodhisattva vow to lead to nirvana the whole immeasurable world of beings, as the Prajnaparamita Sutras state, is the central characteristic of the bodhisattva. According to the Bodhipathapradipa, a lamp for the path to awakening by the Indian master Atisa, the central defining feature of a bodhisattva's path is the universal aspiration to end suffering for themselves and all other beings. The spiritual motivation is termed bodhicitta, the mind of awakening. Another key virtue of a bodhisattva is their great compassion, maha karuna, which leads one to work tirelessly for the ultimate good of all beings. This universal compassion is foundational for a bodhisattva and leads to bodhicitta. According to the Indian philosopher Shantideva, when great compassion and bodhicitta arises in a person's heart, they cease to be an ordinary person and become a son or daughter of the Buddhas. Another foundational bodhisattva virtue is prajna, transcendent knowledge or wisdom, which is an understanding of the emptiness of things arising from study, deep consideration and meditation. Numerous sutras hold that a key part of the bodhisattva path is the practice of a set of virtues called paramitas, transcendent or supreme virtues. Sometimes six are outlined. Dana paramita, the perfection of giving, Sila Paramita, the perfection of moral conduct or discipline. Kasanti Paramita, the perfection of patient endurance. Virya Paramita, the perfection of vigor or diligence. Dhyana Paramita, the perfection of meditation. Prajna Paramita, the perfection of transcendent wisdom. Other sutras, such as the Dasapumika Sutra, give a list of ten, with the addition of Upaya, skillful means, Pranidhana, vow, resolution, Bala, spiritual power, and Jnana, knowledge. Various texts associate the beginning of the Bodhisattva practice with what is called the path of accumulation or equipment, Sambara Marga, which is the first path of the five path schema, which possibly developed from Sarvastivada sources. The Dasapumika Sutra as well as other texts also outline a series bodhisattva levels or spiritual stages bhumis, on the path. The various texts disagree on the number of stages however, the Dasapumika giving ten for example and mapping each one to the ten paramitas, the Bodhisattvabhumi giving seven and thirteen and the Avatamsaka outlining forty stages. In later Mahayana scholasticism, such as in the work of Kamalashila and Atisa, the five paths and ten bhumi systems are merged and this is the progressive path model that is used in Tibetan Buddhism. According Paul Williams, in these systems, the first bhumi is reached once one attains direct, non-conceptual and non-dull insight into emptiness in meditative absorption, which is associated with the path of seeing darsana marga. Topic. Expedient means Expedient means skt, upaya, is another important skill of the Mahayana Bodhisattva. The idea is most famously expounded in the Lotus Sutra, one of the earliest dated sutras, and is accepted in all Mahayana schools of thought. 
It is any effective method or technique that aids awakening. It does not necessarily mean that some particular method is untrue, but is simply any means or stratagem that is conducive to spiritual growth and leads beings to awakening and nirvana. Expedient means could thus be certain motivational words for a particular listener or even the Noble Eightfold Path itself. Basic Buddhism what Mahayana would term Sravakayana or Pratyekabuddhayana is an expedient method for helping people begin the Noble Buddhist Path and advance quite far. But the path is not wholly traversed, according to some schools, until the practitioner has striven for and attained Buddhahood for the liberation of all other sentient beings from suffering. Some scholars have stated that the exercise of expedient means, the ability to adapt one's message to the audience, is also of enormous importance in the Pali Canon. In fact, the Pali term Upaya Kosala does occur in the Pali Canon, in the Sangiti Sutta of the Diga Nikaya. Topic. Major philosophical ideas Topic. Sunyavada A central doctrine discussed by numerous Mahayana texts is the theory of emptiness or voidness sunyata. It is considered to be an essential doctrine of the Prajnaparamita genre of sutras as well as the core teaching of the Madhyamaka philosophy. This theory amounts to the idea that all phenomena dharmas without exception have no essential unchanging core and therefore have no fundamentally real existence. Because of this, all things, even the dharma, the Buddha and all beings, are like illusions maya and dreams svapna. Obtaining a deep understanding of this is said to be the prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom. The Mahayana philosophical school termed Madhyamaka middle theory or centrism, also known as Sunyavada, the emptiness theory, which was founded by the 2nd century figure of Nagarjuna focuses on refuting all theories which posit any kind of substance, inherent existence or intrinsic nature svabhava. Nagarjuna attempts to show in his works that any theory of intrinsic nature is contradicted by the Buddha's theory of dependent origination, since anything that has an independent existence cannot be dependently originated. The Sunyavada philosophers were adamant that their denial of svabhava is not a kind of nihilism against protestations to the contrary by their opponents. Using the two truths theory they claimed that while one can speak of things existing in a conventional, relative sense, they do not exist inherently in an ultimate sense. They also argued that emptiness itself is also empty. It does not have an absolute inherent existence nor does it mean a transcendental absolute reality, but is merely a useful concept or abstraction. In fact, since everything is empty of true existence, all things are just conceptualizations prajñapti matra, including the theory of emptiness, and all concepts must ultimately be abandoned in order to truly understand the nature of things. Topic. Vijñānavada Vijñānavada, the doctrine of consciousness, a.k.a. Vijñapti matra perceptions only, ansata matra, mind only, is another important doctrine promoted by some Mahayana sutras and later became the central theory of a major philosophical movement which arose during the Gupta period called Yogacara. The primary sutra associated with this school of thought is the Samdhanirmokana Sutra, which claims that Sunyavada is not the final definitive teaching of the Buddha. Instead, the ultimate truth Paramartha Satya is said to be the view that all things dharmas are only mind sata, consciousness vijnana, or perceptions vijnapti, and that seemingly external objects or internal subjects do not really exist apart from the dependently originated flow of mental experiences. When this flow of mentality is seen as being empty of the subject-object duality we impose upon it, one reaches the non-dual cognition of Thusness, tathata, which is nirvana. This doctrine is developed through various theories, the most important being the eight consciousnesses and the three natures. The Samdhanirmokana calls its doctrine the third turning of the Dharma wheel. The Pratyatpana Sutra also mentions this doctrine, stating, Whatever belongs to this triple world is nothing but thought. Why is that? 
It is because however I imagine things, that is how they appear. The most influential thinkers in this tradition were the Indian brothers Asanga and Vasubandhu, along with an obscure figure termed Maitrayanatha. Yogacara philosophers developed their own interpretation of the doctrine of emptiness which also criticized Madhyamaka for falling into nihilism. Tathagatagarbha The doctrine of Tathagata store or Tathagata womb Tathagatagarbha, also known as Buddha nature or Buddha principle SKT, Buddha Dhatu, is important in all modern Mahayana traditions, though interpreted in different ways. Broadly speaking Buddha nature is concerned with ascertaining what allows sentient beings to become Buddhas. The term may have first appeared in the Mahayana Mahaparinirvana Sutra, where it refers to a sacred nature that is the basis for beings becoming Buddhas, and where it is also spoken of as the self Atman. The doctrine of a really existing permanent element within all sentient beings is a source of much debate and disagreement among Mahayana Buddhist philosophers as well as modern academics. Some scholars have seen this as an influence from Brahmanic Hinduism, while some of these sutras admit that the use of the term self is partly done in order to win over non Buddhist ascetics. According to some scholars, the Buddha nature discussed in some Mahayana sutras does not represent a substantial self, Atman, rather, it is a positive language and expression of emptiness sunyata, and represents the potentiality to realize Buddhahood through Buddhist practices. Other Mahayana philosophies like Madhyamaka were mainly dominated by a discourse of emptiness, which used primarily negative or apophatic language. The Buddha nature genre of sutras can be seen as an attempt to state Buddhist teachings using positive language while also maintaining the middle way, to prevent people from being turned away from Buddhism by a false impression of nihilism. A different view is propounded by Tathagatagarbha specialist, Michael Zimmerman, who sees key Buddha nature sutras such as the Nirvana Sutra and the Tathagatagarbha Sutra as teaching an affirmative vision of an eternal, indestructible Buddhic self. The Uttaratantra, an exegetical treatise on Buddha nature, sees Buddha nature as eternal, uncaused, unconditioned, and incapable of being destroyed, although temporarily concealed within worldly beings by adventitious defilements. According to C. D. Sebastian, the Uttaratantra's reference to a transcendental self Atma should be understood as the unique essence of the universe. Thus the universal and immanent essence of Buddha nature is the same throughout time and space. <laughs> <laughs> Scripture Mahayana Buddhism takes the basic teachings of the Buddha as recorded in early scriptures as the starting point of its teachings, such as those concerning karma and rebirth, anatman, emptiness, dependent origination, and the Four Noble Truths. Mahayana Buddhists in East Asia have traditionally studied these teachings in the agamas preserved in the Chinese Buddhist canon. Agama is the term used by those traditional Buddhist schools in India who employed Sanskrit for their basic canon. These correspond to the Nikayas used by the Theravada school. The surviving Agamas in Chinese translation belong to at least two schools. Most of the Agamas were never translated into the Tibetan canon, which according to Hirakawa, only contains a few translations of early sutras corresponding to the Nikayas or Agamas. However, these basic doctrines are contained in Tibetan translations of later works such as the Abhidharmakosa and the Yogacarabhumi Sastra. Topic. Mahayana Sutras In addition to accepting the essential scriptures of the early Buddhist schools as valid, Mahayana Buddhism maintains large collections of sutras that are not recognized as authentic by the modern Theravada school. The earliest of these sutras do not call themselves Mahayana, but use the terms Vipulya extensive sutras, or Gambara profound sutras. These were also not recognized by some individuals in the early Buddhist schools. In other cases, Buddhist communities such as the Mahasamgika school were divided along these doctrinal lines. In Mahayana Buddhism, the Mahayana sutras are often given greater authority than the agamas. 
The first of these Mahayana-specific writings were written probably around the 1st century BCE or 1st century CE. Some influential Mahayana sutras are the Prajnaparamita Sutras, the Lotus Sutra, the Pure Land Sutras, the Vimalakirti Sutra, the Golden Light Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Santhinirmokana Sutra and the Tathagatagarbha Sutras. According to David Drews, Mahayana sutras contain several elements besides the promotion of the Bodhisattva ideal, including expanded cosmologies and mythical histories, ideas of pure lands and great, celestial Buddhas and bodhisattvas, descriptions of powerful new religious practices, new ideas on the nature of the Buddha, and a range of new philosophical perspectives." These texts present stories of revelation in which the Buddha teaches Mahayana sutras to certain bodhisattvas who vow to teach and spread these sutras after the Buddha's death. Regarding religious praxis, David Drews outlines the most commonly promoted practices in Mahayana sutras were seen as means to achieve Buddhahood quickly and easily and included hearing the names of certain Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, maintaining Buddhist precepts, and listening to, memorizing, and copying sutras, that they claim can enable rebirth in the pure lands Abharati and Sukhavati, where it is said to be possible to easily acquire the merit and knowledge necessary to become a Buddha in as little as one lifetime. Another widely recommended practice is Anamodana, or rejoicing in the good deeds of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The practice of meditation and visualization of Buddhas has been seen by some scholars as a possible explanation for the source of certain Mahayana sutras which are seen traditionally as direct visionary revelations from the Buddhas in their pure lands. Paul Harrison has also noted the importance of dream revelations in certain Mahayana sutras such as the Arya Svapna Nirdesa which lists and interprets 108 dream signs, as noted by Paul Williams, one feature of Mahayana sutras especially earlier ones is the phenomenon of laudatory self-reference, the lengthy praise of the sutra itself, the immense merits to be obtained from treating even a verse of it with reverence, and the nasty penalties which will accrue in accordance with karma to those who denigrate the scripture. Some Mahayana sutras also warn against the accusation that they are not the word of the Buddha Buddhavacana, such as the Astasahasrika 8,000 verse Prajnaparamita, which states that such claims come from Mara the evil tempter. Some of these Mahayana sutras also warn those who would denigrate Mahayana sutras or those who preach it i.e. the Dharmabhanaka that this action can lead to rebirth in hell. Another feature of some Mahayana sutras, especially later ones, is increasing sectarianism and animosity towards non-Mahayana practitioners sometimes called sravakas, hearers, which are sometimes depicted as being part of the Hinayana the inferior way who refuse to accept the superior way of the Mahayana. As noted by Paul Williams, earlier Mahayana sutras like the Ugrapriprasha Sutra and the Ahidasena Sutra do not present any antagonism towards the hearers or the ideal of arhatship like later sutras do. Regarding the Bodhisattva path, some Mahayana sutras promote it as a universal path for everyone, while others like the Ugrapriprasha see it as something for a small elite of hardcore ascetics. In the 4th century Mahayana Abhidharma work Abhidharmasamukkaya, a Sangha refers to the collection which contains the Agamas as the Sravakapitaka and associates it with the Sravakas and Pratyakabuddhas. A Sangha classifies the Mahayana Sutras as belonging to the Bodhisattva Pitaka, which is designated as the collection of teachings for Bodhisattvas. <laughs> Other literature Mahayana Buddhism also developed a massive commentarial and exegetical literature, many of which are called Sastra treatises or Vrtis commentaries. Philosophical texts were also written in verse form karikas, such as in the case of the famous Mulamajimika Karika root verses on the middle way by Nagarjuna, the foundational text of Madhyamika philosophy. Numerous later Madhyamika philosophers like Kandrakirti wrote commentaries on this work as well as their own verse works. Mahayana Buddhist tradition also relies on numerous non-Mahayana works, a very influential one being the Abhidharmakosha of Vasubandhu, which is written from a non-Mahayana Sarvastivada Satrantika perspective. 
Vasubandhu is also the author of various Mahayana Yogacara texts on the philosophical theory known as Vijñapti Matra conscious construction only. The Yogacara school philosopher Asanga is also credited with numerous highly influential sastras. In East Asia, the Satyasiddhi Sastra was also influential. Another influential tradition is that of Dignaga's Buddhist logic whose work focused on epistemology. He produced the Pramanasamukkaya, and later Dharmakirti wrote the Pramanavartika, which was a commentary and reworking of the Dignaga text. Later Tibetan and Chinese Buddhists continued the tradition of writing sastra and commentaries. Topic. Classifications Dating back at least to the Samdhanirmocana Sutra is a classification of the corpus of Buddhism into three categories, based on ways of understanding the nature of reality, known as the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. According to this view, there were three such turnings. In the first turning, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths at Varanasi for those in the Sravaka vehicle. It is described as marvelous and wonderful, but requiring interpretation and occasioning controversy. The doctrines of the first turning are exemplified in the Dharmakakra Pravartana Sutra. This turning represents the earliest phase of the Buddhist teachings and the earliest period in the history of Buddhism. In the second turning, the Buddha taught the Mahayana teachings to the bodhisattvas, teaching that all phenomena have no essence, no arising, no passing away, are originally quiescent, and essentially in cessation. This turning is also described as marvelous and wonderful, but requiring interpretation and occasioning controversy. Doctrine of the second turning is established in the Prajnaparamita teachings, first put into writing around 100 BCE. In Indian philosophical schools, it is exemplified by the Madhyamaka school of Nagarjuna. In the third turning, the Buddha taught similar teachings to the second turning, but for everyone in the three vehicles, including all the sravakas, pratyekabuddhas, and bodhisattvas. These were meant to be completely explicit teachings in their entire detail, for which interpretations would not be necessary, and controversy would not occur. These teachings were established by the Samdhanirmocana Sutra as early as the 1st or 2nd century CE. In the Indian philosophical schools, the third turning is exemplified by the Yogacara school of Asanga and Vasubandhu. Some traditions of Tibetan Buddhism consider the teachings of esoteric Buddhism and Vajrayana to be the third turning of the Dharma wheel. Tibetan teachers, particularly of the Gelugpa school, regard the second turning as the highest teaching, because of their particular interpretation of Yogacara doctrine. The Buddha nature teachings are normally included in the third turning of the wheel. The different Chinese Buddhist traditions have different schemes of doctrinal periodization called Panjiao, which they use to organize the sometimes bewildering array of texts. Topic. Relationship with the early texts Scholars have noted that many key Mahayana ideas are closely connected to the earliest texts of Buddhism. The seminal work of Mahayana philosophy, Nagarjuna's Mulamadhyamakakarika, mentions the canon's Katyayana Sutra by name, and may be an extended commentary on that work. Nagarjuna systematized the Madhyamaka school of Mahayana philosophy. He may have arrived at his positions from a desire to achieve a consistent exegesis of the Buddha's doctrine as recorded in the canon. In his eyes the Buddha was not merely a forerunner, but the very founder of the Madhyamaka system. Nagarjuna also referred to a passage in the canon regarding nirvanic consciousness. In two different works, Yogacara, the other prominent Mahayana school in dialectic with the Madhyamaka school, gave a special significance to the canon's lesser discourse on emptiness MA 190. A passage there which the discourse itself emphasizes is often quoted in later Yogacara texts as a true definition of emptiness. According to Walpola Rahula, the thought presented in the Yogacara school's Abhidharma Samakaya is undeniably closer to that of the Pali Nikayas than is that of the Theravadan Abhidhamma. Both the Madhyamikas and the Yogacarans saw themselves as preserving the Buddhist middle way between the extremes of nihilism everything is unreal and substantialism substantial entities existing. 
The Yogacarans criticized the Madhyamikas for tending towards nihilism, while the Madhyamikas criticized the Yogacarans for tending towards substantialism. Key Mahayana texts introducing the concepts of Bodhicitta and Buddha nature also use language parallel to passages in the canon containing the Buddha's description of luminous mind and appear to have evolved from this idea. Topic. Theravada school Topic. Role of the Bodhisattva In the early Buddhist texts, and as taught by the modern Theravada school, the goal of becoming a teaching Buddha in a future life is viewed as the aim of a small group of individuals striving to benefit future generations after the current Buddha's teachings have been lost, but in the current age there is no need for most practitioners to aspire to this goal. Theravada texts do, however, hold that this is a more perfectly virtuous goal. Paul Williams writes that some modern Theravada meditation masters in Thailand are popularly regarded as bodhisattvas. Cholvahan observes that prominent figures associated with the self perspective in Thailand have often been famous outside scholarly circles as well, among the wider populace, as Buddhist meditation masters and sources of miracles and sacred amulets. Like perhaps some of the early Mahayana forest hermit monks, or the later Buddhist tantrics, they have become people of power through their meditative achievements. They are widely revered, worshipped, and held to be arhats or note bodhisattvas. <laughs> Topic. Theravada and Hinayana In the 7th century, the Chinese Buddhist monk Xuanzang describes the concurrent existence of the Mahavihara and the Abhyagiri Vihara in Sri Lanka. He refers to the monks of the Mahavihara as the Hinayana Staviras, Theras, and the monks of the Abhyagiri Vihara as the Mahayana Staviras. Xuanzang further writes, the Mahaviharavasins reject the Mahayana and practice the Hinayana, while the Abhyagiraviharavasins study both Hinayana and Mahayana teachings and propagate the Tripit aka. The modern Theravada school is usually described as belonging to Hinayana. Some authors have argued that it should not be considered such from the Mahayana perspective. Their view is based on a different understanding of the concept of Hinayana. Rather than regarding the term as referring to any school of Buddhism that hasn't accepted the Mahayana canon and doctrines, such as those pertaining to the role of the Bodhisattva, these authors argue that the classification of a school as Hinayana should be crucially dependent on the adherence to a specific phenomenological position. They point out that unlike the now extinct Sarvastivada school, which was the primary object of Mahayana criticism, the Theravada does not claim the existence of independent entities dharmas. in this it maintains the attitude of early Buddhism. Adherents of Mahayana Buddhism disagreed with the substantialist thought of the Sarvastivadins and Satrantikas, and in emphasizing the doctrine of emptiness, Kalupahana holds that they endeavored to preserve the early teaching. The Theravadins too refuted the Sarvastivadins and Satrantikas and other schools on the grounds that their theories were in conflict with the non-substantialism of the canon. The Theravada arguments are preserved in the Kathavathu. Some contemporary Theravadin figures have indicated a sympathetic stance toward the Mahayana philosophy found in texts such as the Heart Sutra (SKT). Prajnaparamita Hridaya and Nagarjuna's fundamental stanzas on the Middle Way (SKT). Mulamadhyamakakarika. Topic. See also. Equals equals notes. <laughs>